right now on Amplified, the Engineers Ireland podcast. We get behind the scenes at 999 and hear how their engineers handle the biggest emergency of our time. We brainstormed it on Thursday afternoon. We had a prototype on the Friday morning. We proved the prototype Friday night. We built it or productionized it on Saturday and Sunday. And the first calls were taken from home Monday afternoon. Hi there, my name is Dusty Rhodes and you're welcome to Amplified, the Engineers Journal podcast. In this episode, we're about to dive into the world of telecommunications and hear how an engineering mindset is vital to keeping up with operations in a fast-paced industry. Our guest today has worked extensively in the area where his career has taken him from the birth of the internet in Ireland to the last few years, where he's acted as the head of operations of the emergency call answering service with BT. I'm delighted to welcome Michael Kelly. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, I'm great, Justin. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Listen, can I start with the emergency call answering service? It's kind of something that we take for granted. You know, you just dial 112 or 999, but a few of us, very few of us understand how it actually works. How, how do you explain the service to people simply? Well, I think everybody's familiar with the uh, the concept of you dial 999 or 112 and you're put through to the emergency services. I think the majority of people probably assume that it's um, a guard a call taker or a guard who uh, actually takes the call. That's not how it works. And in most countries, that's not how it works. Generally, there's what we call a stage one service. And that takes the emergency call and determines with you, the caller, what is the emergency service that you really need. And in our case, in Ireland, that can be Garda, ambulance, fire or coast guard. So that determination is made. We gather some information. Uh, We also are gathering some technical information in the background that you wouldn't be aware of. And then that is passed as a package, the video, the data, the metadata to the emergency service. And then you get the the help that, that you need. I have in my imagination that people are making a phone call. You talk about gathering information that people aren't aware of. Are you able to take things like, you know, the the location of a person's mobile phone or their number or where the area they might even be? Well, like most things in life, it's about location, location, location. If we can find you, we can help you. If we can't find you, we can't help you. It's as simple as that. So the technology has been improved, I suppose, from... 999 goes back to about the 1930s, where location would have been communicated verbally. But the problem with that is that the the caller may not be particularly verbal, or they may be completely unaware of where they actually are, or they have unfortunately met with such an incident that they no longer remember where they are. So to get over that, technology has become even more important than actually getting an address or an allocation from the the caller. So uh, over the last probably seven or eight years, we've improved uh, mobile communications particularly, such that how it works now for the majority of of calls, and the majority of calls these days, probably 75, 80% of emergency calls are made on a a mobile phone as opposed to a fixed line. In the background, the handset is using various uh, location technology, is getting a GPS coordinate of exactly where you are. And in parallel to the call, we use SMS, where there's no record on the phone at all of it, but it's used to transmit transmit continuously updated uh, locations. Typically, the first location that we get is relatively inaccurate. It might be maybe to 100 meters accuracy. But by the time we get the the second or third one, it may be down to two meters accuracy. And that happens within 15 to 20 seconds. First problem I can see coming up with this is GDPR and data protection. How how do you get over that problem? Very, very simple. Uh, There is uh, an actual carve out in the data protection legislation, which basically says in layman's language, well, if this is an emergency, then all bets are off and it's in your best interest that we're able to find you. Now, having said that, we go to enormous lengths to protect that information. People uh, probably assume that, you know, we we just pass on the location uh, willy-nilly. No, we don't. It's only passed to the emergency services. Occasionally, we will get requests 
for call recordings and other information about calls. And it is only when people have satisfied the very, very stringent, most stringent requirements that a call recording might be released. And of course, it has to be strictly relevant to the person themselves. Getting people help and getting them help fast and knowing where they are, I mean, they're all very important. But what kind of levels are you dealing with? I mean, how many calls do you get a day or across a year? How how quickly do you answer calls? That kind of stuff. Uptime is another. Uh, Yeah, uptime is another thing. I'll come back to that. To your first question, we do 2.4 million calls. So 200,000 a month, 50,000 a week, 6,000 a day. Having said that, that isn't a complete answer because it's, I suppose I would say that emergency calls are extremely predictable. We're dealing with human beings worldwide and they, they work in very predictable patterns. And th- that's an area that I'm very interested in myself. The sheer predictability of it is, is quite fascinating. But 6,000 calls a day, it probably falls to maybe 5,500 during the week. As the weekends come in, it gets a little bit busier. And in particular, then Friday nights and Saturday nights would be the busiest of all. And clearly, Friday nights and Saturday nights then also fall into the small hours of the following morning as well. It also has a, there's a a little bit of a different pattern between emergency calls to police or Garda and to ambulance. Ambulance, the volumes grow through the day on a very, very gradual basis peaking probably around 11 or 12 o'clock at night, whereas Garda calls would probably start to peak earlier in the day, but be much more erratic uh, up and down. The other thing that's fascinating as well about it is that a Garda call from start to finish, and one one of our jobs is that we record everything and all data for evidence purposes for the courts and for, for investigations. But a Garda call typically takes about two minutes, 120 seconds. The average ambulance call takes about six minutes with a very, very long statistical tail. We would have some calls that would go up to 24, 25 minutes. This could be for a number of reasons. Either there's a difficulty with finding the person or actually there there is a paramedic providing information or instructions to the the caller or the, the victim, unfortunately, while the ambulance arrives. If, if I'd say one thing about uh, ECAS, it's all about data. It's really, really very statistically driven. I'm fascinated to hear how you say that calls to emergency lines are very predictable. It's not anything I would have expected you to have said. Uh, can you give me an example of that kind of predictability on, on a call? Well, I, I could tell you that the, the, if you like, what I would call the safest time of the week is, a, is about 10.30 on a Tuesday morning. And basically how I would rationalize it is that everybody has either gone to work or they've gotten, they're already in school or they haven't got out of bed yet, but they're not going anywhere because actually the chief determinant of uh, 99 calls, believe it or not, is weather. If the weather is bad, we'll get more calls. Now, that doesn't mean that more people are necessarily out and about. It just means that they're more likely to get themselves into a spot of bother more likely to have a car accident. They're more likely to trip. They're more likely to slip. And obviously, the more severe the weather becomes, the more accidents that are are likely to have. Ironically, even though there are probably fewer fewer people out and about. The other way of looking at it is that, um, and, and, and I suppose, unfortunately, and this is not unique to Ireland, but in most countries in the world, Friday nights and Saturday nights are where people get themselves into the most trouble probably the most severe trouble. And it's it's when uh, response times by the emergency services tend to back up a bit. Now, I, I would say that emergency services are built around the peaks, but during busy periods, there's always going to be um, some sort of a, of a, of a wait. But the, the job of ECAS is to, to somehow ease the path through to the emergency services. And even if they are busy, and they're not in a position to answer that particular emergency call, that we would be in a position to reassure the caller, make sure that they don't hang up. Because again, in a panic, I think a lot of people's instinct is, I'll hang up and I'll dial again. Well, if you do that, uh, you'd go back to the beginning of the of the queue. So our, our advice is always just stick with us, listen to the instructions, and we'll get you there. 
Can I ask you then as well about uptime? It's a phenomenal statistic. What is what is your uptime guarantee? Our uptime guarantee is, well, first and foremost, some people say, oh, well, it must be 100%. Well, as an engineer, I know that nothing is ever 100%. So what we commit to contractually, and I don't think this is a, a state secret in our contract with government, but it is what we call five nines, 99.999%. Now, that's a very glib figure, but the truth is to make that work, we have to duplicate, triplicate, quadruplicate systems so that we've got a huge amount of redundancy in the various systems Basically, no one issue can take out the entire platform. But the bigger challenge for us is that the, the system itself, we, we, we need to maintain it. We need to patch software. We need to replace hardware. But it's, it's, like, the, it's like that old adage about the 747 in the air. We're, we're changing the engines without landing the, the plane. We, we cannot say to the public, oh, we need to do a big job on ECAS. So I'll tell you what, we're going to take it down nine o'clock on Friday, but we'll be back on Monday morning. That doesn't work. So there's never a good time for us to do maintenance. So therefore, we do, we're we constantly working on the system round the clock and making sure that our change control is absolutely state-of-the-art engineering-wise so that even if we do make a mistake or if we have a problem, we can roll back without anybody realizing that there was ever a problem in the first place. It sounds like uh, you have your system and then a backup for the system and then a backup for the backup system and then a backup backup for the backup system, which, you know, I'm delighted to hear that. But from an engineering perspective, uh, can you give me an example of the kind of infrastructure that you have in place? Okay. Um, yes, we have uh, two operator centers. So this is where call takers uh, can take calls. We also have connections to them. They can also work from home, which is also part of our contingency in case we have uh, big storms or, or, or something like that. We have two data centers. We have two backup operator centers and we have two backup data centers, all interlinked using multiple carriers, i.e. multiple telecoms companies. Some people think when, once they hear that BT operate this, that it's all uh, BT telecommunications links in between all of the sites. And with that number of sites, it gets incredibly complex to make sure that we've got redundant paths and resilient links and so on. No, we, we actually use every telecoms provider in the state. So we use ESB telecoms, we use ENET, we use AIR, we use BT in, in all honesty, and a couple of other players as well. And we use a variety of, even within those telecommunications networks, a variety of different telecommunications protocols and techniques so that not, we're not reliant on just one protocol like uh, IP or something like that. We have, we have backups to the backups. And tell me about the engineers that are in the organization, because engineers play a very important role within the ECAS organization. What kind of problems do they have to solve on a, on a regular basis? I suppose the basis would be that they would be all IT specialists with a, a very heavy emphasis on telecommunications as well. But on top of that layered in, they would have uh, skills in, in software, but also a very, very good working knowledge of uh, handsets, particularly mobile phone handsets. And you must remember as well that we've got to be able to support calls the highest level with the highest bandwidth that we can get from the humblest, oldest Nokia phone that somebody only uses once or twice a year, all the way up to the latest Apple and uh, Samsung handsets. The other thing that we need to, uh, to watch out for is software changes on the, the handsets. Sometimes inadvertently, depending on the manufacturer, and I won't mention any names, but sometimes issues creep in with regard to emergency calls that were actually designed to help the more ordinary run-of-the-mill uh, calls. A, a good example of it, of it this year was, and it, it was in the, let's say, the Android sphere, but it, it had an impact on all manufacturers of Android handsets. So it wasn't a particular manufacturer. A change was introduced so that if, if you picked up your Android handset, irrespective of make, if you pressed a number of times on the side, and I don't want to specify the number for obvious reasons, if she pressed a button on the side of the phone a number of times, 
it would automatically make an emergency call. Now, that generated uh, over about a year, I don't want to put a figure on it either, but a huge number of silent calls, calls that should never have been made because people didn't know, right? They might notice that that evening when they pick up their phone and they see all these 112 calls. And that that was just basically down to a, a software change that was designed to help other issues within, within the phone. As emergency services, we don't want it to be too easy to make emergency calls. We want it to be deliberate, okay? Because otherwise you can have a situation where, you know, people literally walking down the road with the phone in the back of their jeans and their back pocket, it can, it can ring emergency services. So it was well-intentioned, but it went wrong. I suspect that problem generated probably a billion calls worldwide. <sighs> wow. Uh, it would have affected every country. But what I can say is because, because of our engineers and, and one in particular, I think we were probably the first country to identify what the problem was. And then in conjunction with, say, our, our colleagues in other, in other European countries, and we do work very, very closely together. And because, as I say, dealing with human beings who do tend to behave in the same way, they use the same sorts of equipment to interact with uh, emergency services. If we see a problem in one country, 10 to 1, you're going to see it in every other country. So we do cooperate very, very closely. So that's probably the best recent example that, that I can give you. I don't want to dwell on this because it's over, fingers crossed. But when COVID hit, that was an emergency that was developing so fast and everybody just had to run with it. I'm sure ECAS was no exception uh, and everybody was told to work from home. How did you handle that problem? Well, right up to that point, I think it was the, the middle of March in, in that year. And I, I can't remember which year it is now because it's all a blur. But up to that point, we didn't have working from home. There was never any requirement for it. And in fact, if I'm honest, our preference would be to have people working in centers because all the technology is there. And they have access to engineers. They have, they're working in centers which are designed to work 24-7, have generators if there's a power outage and so on, which is completely unlike our, our own homes. So I think it was a Thursday uh, we said, right, we, we need to build a, a remote working uh, solution. So we brainstormed it on Thursday afternoon. We had a prototype on the Friday morning. We proved the prototype Friday night. We built it or productionized it on Saturday and Sunday. And the first calls were taken from home, live calls, not test calls, Monday afternoon. Now, I, I, would, I would be the first one to say that you know, and, and we work in, in BT, which is, a, a, you know, really is an engineering-led uh, company. I think if, we, if I had put out a request, let's develop that capability in normal time, it probably would have taken six months because we would have gone through all of the things that you have to do in terms of testing and, and so on. And not to say that we didn't do all that, we just did it a hell of a lot quicker, with much, much, much more folks. But we then moved over to a situation where very, very quickly, I think, probably 70% of calls were taken from home. The other thing that we had to do, of course, is that staff were used to uh, working with a workstation rather than a laptop. So it would have had a purpose-built PC, essentially, in old money on, on the desk in front of them. So we had to, we've, we've about 65, 70 people taking calls around 24-7. So we had to procure 70 laptops plus spares at a time when everybody else was looking for laptops. Now, luckily, I was able to pull in a few favors and BT is a big company. Um, so we were able to get, you know, access to certain s stocks and so on. But that was the other worry. You know, it's, it's one thing to get the technology right, but then are you actually, got, will you have the tools to use it? And, and I think that's probably where a lot of companies, organizations probably slipped up uh, well-meaning, in a well-meaning manner, they were able to get the technology to do what they want, but it just kind of fell at the last hurdle. That was an amazing feat. Uh, and all I can think of is, uh, as you tell that story, is, is this is why we need engineers in the world. Boom, 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 problem solved. Tell me, aside from COVID, because that is an exceptional circumstance, what would you say was the, was the second biggest emergency that you've had to deal with in your time? Well, I did say before that... Um, the biggest determinant of uh, emergency calls, particularly when it gets out of that predictability uh, phase, is weather. 
And I, I would think back to the various storms that we've had. There was one back in 2016. We've had some years where we've had maybe one or two kind of hurricane type storms. And then other years we've had maybe nine or 10 successive weekends where we've had really, really bad storms. That has an effect on the public because that, you know, there, there's going to be more accidents. Even if they don't leave the house, they might fall down the stairs. And that, that still creates uh, challenges. But what it meant was the weather was so bad uh, on these occasions. And don't forget that we had not got home working or remote working available at that stage. We still needed to get people into sites. So what we did was we increased the number of sites. And that's when we, in addition to our two permanent sites, we brought in, we built contingency centers so that the centers were actually closer to, to staff. And then the, the other thing was, with, with great cooperation from our staff, I have to say, we, we said, well, look, we may, we may have to work longer shifts, but we would put you up. We may even put you up in, in centers, right, with sleeping bags. Now, actually, as it turned out, we didn't, we didn't really have to go that far. But what we did do was we would put staff up in hotels next door so that they didn't have to go home. And our only ask of them was, look, bring a bag bring it back for, you know, five days or a week. We really don't know how long this is going to go on. But with a, you know, a bit of, I suppose, a bit of thought goes into it. While it's stressful at the time and you, you think, oh, how are we going to solve this problem? Nothing is impossible if you set your mind to it. And, and that, you know, genuinely is our mantra. It has to be that way. We, we can't just give up. So I think, I think that would probably be the, the other the other issue, obviously, we've had technical challenges over the years, but generally through a you know, combination of backups and so on, we've been able to overcome that and the great Irish public wouldn't have even been aware. Michael, you're very much at the cutting edge, if you want, of technology. I hate that phrase, but um, mm-hmm. you're dealing with what's now, which is fantastic. And you're probably looking at what's coming in the near future, which is fantastic. Let me take you back, though, to many, many moons ago when you worked with Post Gem, which was a, a section of Unpost. And I love, I only learned this recently, Post Gem stands for Global Electronic Messaging. That's how far back we're going. Pre-email almost, or pre-text, or pre-SMS, or, or whatever, maybe. Um, can you describe to me what Post Gem was, but also of key interest, the setup between them and Ireland's first internet service provider at the time, uh, Ireland Online. Okay, uh, well, it's it's a whole subject in itself. But (laughs) to start with with PostGem, it was a subsidiary of of Unpost, actually. They set it up as a a separate company. I brought in people with, I suppose, a certain amount of IT or telecommunications background, plus a lot of marketing, because it was Essentially, what it was set up to do was to try and develop a new market. And if you if you could cast your mind back to the very late 80s, 1989, this is pre-email. All bills went in the post, and that's where Unpus came in. But thanks to the foresight of, of a, a couple of very, very clever people, even then they realized that hard copy, as it used to be referred to, probably wasn't going to be there forever. And the Unpost needed to start thinking about the, the future. And it was, it was certainly the first, I think, uh, a post office in the whole world that started to think that way. It was very, very pioneering. But when we got, it was all very well saying it, but uh, electronic mail was very much in its infancy. I think I had, you know, I had used it in my previous IT career to probably, you know, communicate with a few other people and maybe with some some vendors. But it wasn't in general use. And and, and it it was also quite slow. You know, you didn't get an email instantly like we did today. But once uh, PostGem got up and running, initially, I think our first service was people could send in communications like bills or or, uh, circulars electronically, and then we would actually print them and put them into a letter. So it was electronic to hard copy. But it's amazing. That sounds ridiculous now, but it actually got people into the idea. The other thing that we introduced was electronic data interchange, which was electronic to electronic. And and basically that was sending purchase orders and invoices from one company to another, completely electronically, and using a set of standards that worked very well, but has become the precursor of what we know now, I would say even pretty much like if you were to go on 
the various well-known websites and order books or, or whatever, whatever it is. Definitely the precursor of that. And then also the third service that we, we introduced then was very much the precursor of electronic mail today. Uh, the only difference was that it was it was a connection rather than to the internet. It was connected to a a network of other nodes around the con- uh, around the world, and only people who were subscribed to those those services or those nodes could send and receive emails. It wasn't a completely open system like we we have today, where you can send an email to someone you don't know or you've never you've never met. So with those three services in mind, um, they began to pick up traction and people began to say, okay. And actually we had a lot of visits from other post offices interested in what we were doing. And then to underlie that, and I, I suppose maybe this is something that I brought to it, I realized that in order to really make this work, we needed to have our own network. At that time, due to legislation and licensing and so on, Really, it, the underlying telecommunications had to be Telecom Air, which, as we know, was the monopoly back then. So we got the first value-added services license. A value-added services license allowed you to offer value adds over a telecom service. But then we went and we said, right, we will build our own uh, data network, our own packet-switched network. And that actually became the precursor to uh, our, our cooperation with Ireland Online. So to answer your second question, Ireland Online or IOL was becoming very, very successful in the, in the marketplace. There was a real appetite there for communications. And I think also as well, because we had a certain amount of, in time, we had a certain amount of in- insight into the demographics. Ireland was becoming more open. People were emigrating. There was a lot of immigration. People needed to communicate and you know, instant communication was was what it was all about. And bear in mind, mobile phones were still expensive to, you know, to ring somebody for five minutes or even uh, landlines for, for five minutes. Whereas electronic mail was free and you could send as much as you wanted. You could say, say as much as you wanted to mommy and daddy. There were, there were no limitations on it. It was a huge time of change around then and very exciting. And it was kind of like Ireland was dragging itself out of the darkness of the 70s and the 80s. And all of a sudden, I mean, we were we were winning Eurovision every year. That's what I remember of the 90s. All right. And it meant we could do anything. And then we had the football and we were actually at a World Cup. We could do anything. And then you start talking about this electronic mail, and email, and then mobile phones were becoming more common, as you say. They were very expensive. Um, it, it, it was an amazing time. And then Ireland Online, I was working with 2FM at the time. And I remember, you know, kind of because we were in the younger end of RTE, it was myself and Barry Lang, uh, were kind of interested in this internet thing and what it was all about. And then we started incorporating it as part of our programs. And then everybody then wanted an email address. And of course, we were using at IOL.ie every day on on the air. And the story goes is that Bertie Ahern, uh, who was Taoiseach at the time, was listening and he went, what's that? I want one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's it from my point of view in that I thought those kind of eddy, uh, very early days of the internet were quite heady. How was it from your point of view introducing the internet to the great Irish public? It, it was really, really exciting times. I mean, uh, very exhausting, very, very long days, but we were we really were making it up as we went along. You know, the pioneers in IOL, Colin Greeley and Barry Flanagan, like were, were real flag bearers for the whole thing. But what I, I suppose what we wanted to do was try and let them get on with what they were good at doing. And I think what PostGen brought to it was we were pretty good. We, we'd mastered the art of infrastructure and also how we could we could host modems and so on. Now, these days, we'd probably say, well, modem? Why, why would you even use a modem? But, <laughs> you know, back then, the internet was about getting a CD on the stuck to a magazine. And you stuck that CD into your PC and it gave you a certain amount of software which allowed you to control a modem at which you had to use the home telephone line. And it was, it was quite slow, but, but it worked. In order to make IOL work and make it successful, we needed to have modems all over the country because what we discovered very, very quickly was that someone in, in Cork or Limerick probably some of, of our listeners would say for obvious reasons, they wouldn't be prepared to dial Dublin. They wanted a local number. They wanted a local 
uh, Cork number or Limerick number and so on and so forth. And I think in the end, we ended up with 26 points of presence around the country uh, in order to take in those calls. And we also had to uh, build a fairly substantial backbone uh, network to, to funnel all of that internet traffic. I think what made it even more exciting was that we just could not have anticipated the demand. As fast as we could put in infrastructure, it was gobbled up. So much so that I was dealing with, and at that time, most of them would have been Silicon Valley-based companies that provided the equipment. They wanted to send us the very latest equipment. We'd be the first in Europe to use it. They might only have one or two being used maybe by AT&T or America Online in the States. They could see that something was really, really happening here, and it was, it was growing really, really quickly. And the other thing that we were able to do was, because nobody had any real ex experience in this, we were recruiting from the univer universities, just graduate engineers, guys that we, guys and girls that we thought, you know, would, would really enjoy this. And it just threw them in at the coalface and, and learn what needed to be done. And I can't say there was a, a plan. The, the plan probably changed every week. But it worked, and it, it's it's one of the things that I'm I'm proudest of in my whole career. I have to say, because the internet now we moved from a, a situation where I think when when we when on Post bought Ireland Online uh, with PostGem, I think we was about fourteen thousand subscribers. Now there were a couple of other providers, but there was probably probably twenty five thousand internet subscribers in the whole country, and that mm. was in ninety six ninety seven. Now everybody uses. It's ubiquitous. You couldn't do without it. Do you have a particular story you like to share from that time? Um, well, I, I do. I, I don't know whether it's a good story or not. Um, <laughs> but I, I, one of our struggles in Ireland Online particularly was the connections to the, the internet. These days, people don't need to really understand how it all works. But back then, we needed a connection to the outside world. And bandwidth or the pipes... Uh, from Dublin to the rest of the world were extremely expensive. At one stage, I, we had a 1.5 megabit connection to the outside world. Nowadays, people have, you know, I, I think I've a, a gigabit into my home, just my house. So we were doing everything that we possibly could. We were trading bandwidth with various providers, talking like in lots of money, like it was getting into the millions of pounds at the time. So one of the things that we did do was we we uh, we did a, a deal with a satellite company. Now everybody talks about satellite and you know what what uh, Elon Musk is doing and there's lots of satellite companies, but we had a headquarters on um, Earlsford Terrace at that time. We got special permission and we need lots of licenses because nobody was doing it to put this great big huge uh, satellite dish up on the roof. So Barry Flanagan and I. <laughs> Got it working, and we said that we well look, let's let's try it, you know, before, and we'll have it to ourselves, right? See what we could do. So Barry and I were up on the roof. This is a six-story roof where we probably really shouldn't have been, to be perfectly honest. But we we uh, plugged in a laptop into the back of it just to see how it would perform, and it was it was going great. And we tried different things, and then I pitched my arm, and the laptop fell off the wall and went straight down onto the ground. It's, it's fair to say it didn't work after that. <laughs> Luckily, it didn't land on anybody. I could just, I, all, the picture in my head is just a pair of you looking and then there's pure silence. Jaws dropped, pure silence. As it, 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 was the, it was the longest, probably 15 <laughs> seconds of my life because a bit like ECAS, when, when things are going badly, time just seems to, to slow down. A lot of what you're talking about, Michael, is you're talking about introducing the internet to Ireland and, and, and satellite connections and a 1.5 meg for the entire country. It's ridiculous when you think about it now. Um, another thing that we talk about all the time here, and we're very blasé about it because we're one of the huge, biggest centres uh, in, in the world for it with Facebook and Google and Microsoft and uh, data centres. They're everywhere. It takes 20% of the power of the country in Ireland. It goes just on data centres. You are the man who installed Ireland's first ever data centre. Tell me more. Probably some politicians would prefer that I had not done this, but... Um but yes, it is true. Um, 
I joined, um, I became part of ESAT Telecom. I suppose to finish the, the post-GM IOL story, it was sold to Dennis O'Brien. You may have heard of him. So um, I moved into uh, to ESAT Telecom and, you know, there was, there was a bit of a, a change around the responsibilities and so on. So Dennis, as, as he did, said, well, look, are you looking for a challenge? Foolishly, I, I said, yes. And uh, he said, well, look, one of the things that we need to do, there's this thing, data, data centers, that's, that's, going to, that's going to be the next big thing. And I, I'll be honest with you, I was skeptical myself. Uh, I really did. But he said, I think you're the man for this because, you know, it's data centers are what's going to drive the internet. And I think up to that point, I certainly thought I didn't have his foresight for sure. His foresight was that the internet needs lots of power and lots of space, disk space, and it needs performance, it needs availability. And that, that basically is a, is a one-line summary description of a data center. So he said, right, we've got to do this. So he said, uh, I, I think we could get a building out in City West which was only really being built at that stage. Now, of course, a very mature business park. But back then, it was, it was nothing. And it had no fiber or any of the telecommunications into it, which is what we really needed. So I think he said this to me at the end of November. And he said, I need it up and running in seven months. Now, I hadn't even seen the building when he said this. And the building was only half built. But that was the challenge. And... It was. It probably was the most stressful uh, period of my career. But we did it by the end of June with a very, very small team. We built a data center. It was the first of its kind. I did go and have a look at a couple of data centers in the States. I think we brought back some good ideas about it, uh, particularly around availability. We hadn't been thinking about that. So generators was something that we spent a lot of money on. And we also had to fight tooth and nail to get telecommunications in from the various providers so that we could connect these, these data service, the servers. And we got it up and running. I think we had our first customers running probably the month before. And probably about 18 months later, it was full. Michael, I could chat to you all day. So just let me wrap up one or two little questions about new technologies. Because like everything you're saying, you, you literally have been at the development end of everything right throughout uh, your your career. So uh, is continuous learning, this is what I want to ask you about. I mean, is that vital for engineers working in telecommunications? I don't mean is it something nice or is CPD something you should do. Is it vital for working in telecommunications in areas like that? It's absolutely vital. I, I think when I started out in my career, there was probably a very much of an emphasis on third level education. And it had, it definitely had its, at its place, but however you were trained or whatever you were qualified in, it was seen as a means to promotion. I think organizations are definitely a lot flatter now. And if you want to be really valuable to an organization, maybe having that master's degree or even a primary degree is, is not going to help you. It gives you some of the tools to learn and maybe to be curious. But I, I think you know, uh, CPD, getting short courses in technology is really, really valuable. You become much more valuable to an organization. That's what I was going to ask you was, how do you do? I mean, how have you done that CPD just to keep it up? Because you do, you're right. You get your degree and you get on the first rung of the ladder and that's it. Your degree is, is worthless after that. You need to keep educating yourself and keeping up to speed. How did you do it working at such a high level? Well, in the 1990s, that is certainly the, the late 80s, uh, 19, uh, 1990s, even though we had the internet then, there was still an emphasis on books. And you would, you would buy books and you would learn that way and you would experiment. Then um, something changed in the, in the vendors, the people who sold the, the routers or the routers and all this telecommunications equipment. They realized that it was changing very, very quickly. And some of those got into training themselves. Good examples would be Cisco with their certification schemes, relatively short courses, but they were internationally recognized. And I saw people who said, well, not only would it make them better at their job, but it made them internationally marketable. So if, you know, one of our young engineers and some of them did decide to go off to Australia or America, they had a recognized qualification. But I think that has probably brought us up to maybe the 2010s. Now I think it's, it's, it's almost going back 
I think you do need the the hard qualifications like the masters and the the bachelor's degrees and and so on. But the speed of change is so much that by the time a course comes out and more importantly is recognised, it's it's nearly out of date. So it, you've got to become a sponge. So I th- to answer your question, I think I went from a very much a, a kind of a, a rigid book learning type of individual because that's what I was that's what I was taught to maybe through the experience and so on that you've got to have your antennae working all the time. Operate as a sponge. Soak up as much information as you possibly can. Some of it's useful. Some of it might actually lead you in a different direction that maybe you didn't even know was was there. But that curiosity is something that that makes you valuable to the organization. And the more valuable to an organization, the more successful you will become. Let me ask you a humdinger of an awful question just to wrap it up, <laughs> right? Right. Because we haven't mentioned AI. I'm just interested for you who has been so successful seeing things with potential and then seeing how they could work in the future and then successfully getting them there. You're looking at AI for the last year. Where do you think AI will have us in 10 years' time? I think in 10 years' time, I, th- I think it'll be slower than we than everybody likes to think. Obviously, there's a lot of hype. I see it first and foremost in the next 10 years as maybe an aid in your ear. Whatever it is that you're doing, say it could be anything from working in a contact center, it could be a, a programmer trying to write a difficult bit of code, almost that kind of help or coach in the ear. I, I see it as, especially in um, hectic areas, I, I don't know much about it, if anything at all, but good example to me would be something like air traffic control, Right. If an air traffic controller were to miss something, there's enough technology out there that you know, by tracking people's eyes on the screen that the AI or some system feeding AI could say, I think he's missed that vital piece of information. Or let I think I should whisper this piece of information in her ear. And it sounds incredible, but the, a lot of the things that AI can already do were incredible even five years ago. So I, uh, on the one hand, I think it would be slower, but I, I really do see it as, as an aid. I, I do think it would be transformative as well in certain industries. I think the first area where it could really transform is in contact centers, because if AI should be able to deal with different accents, it should be able to deal with different languages. It will be building up databases and other types of, of bases that it can uh, and apply. And with just the laws of physics, being able to apply that at the speed of light, either to a screen or, you know, to, to generate uh, something that you call out in the ear of somebody. It, to me, it, it has to be transformative. I don't think it's something to be frightened of. That's something that really annoys me. It's like all technology. But I think back probably 200 years ago when the steam engine was invented, there were probably people giving out about that as well. And it wasn't the be all and end all. The steam engine transformed into something else and AI in time will transform into something again. I often see AI as being like the early days of the internet, which we both ex- experienced in the, in, in the 80s and 90s. And it was the wild west of the internet back then. Whereas I think we're seeing the a, the wild west of AI right now. Listen, Michael, unfortunately, we've run, run out of time. If you're listening and you'd like to find out more about Michael or some of the topics that we talked about today, uh, there's some notes and link details in the description area of the podcast. But for now, Michael Kelly, Head of Operations of the Emergency Call Answering Service at BT Ireland. Thank you so much for joining us today. Not all, Dusty. It's been an absolute pleasure. Do remember for advanced episodes of our Engineers Ireland podcast, more information on engineering across Ireland or career development opportunities, there are libraries of information on our website at engineersireland.ie. Also do share our podcast with a friend in the business. Just tell them to search for Engineers Ireland in their podcast player. The podcast is produced by dustpod.io for Engineers Ireland. Until next time, for myself, Dusty Rhodes, thank you so much for listening. Take care.